This is the Python tutorial for how to read and write optical physiology data using the NeuroData Without Borders or NWB Neurophysiology Data Standard. In this tutorial, we will create an NWB file for a hypothetical experiment recording optical imaging data from a freely moving animal. In this file, we will store information about the experimental subject, such as the animal species, strain, and age, the animal's position over time, trial information, uh, raw two-photon images, the results of image segmentation into ROIs, and the, the fluorescence or DF over F responses. First, in order to work with NWB files on Py in Python, we need to install the PyNWB software. And we can do that using pip or conda. You will need to have Python 3.5 or higher installed. You can use these commands to install uh, PyNWB from the pip uh, package manager, or if you prefer, you can install PyNWB from the conda forge channel in conda. Let's start setting up the NWB file. An NWB file represents a single session of an experiment. Each file must have a session description, an identifier, and a session start time. In the code below, we will create a new NWB file object with those and additional metadata. So here we're importing the NWB file class from the PyNWB package, uh, importing some datetime utilities, and then creating a new uh, datetime variable representing April 25th, 2018 at 2.30 in US Pacific time. Then we will call the NWB file constructor and pass it these various keyword arguments, such as the session description, identifier, and session start time, and the session ID, experimenter name, lab name, institution name, and any uh, publications related to this data. The first three arguments here are required, and the last five here are optional. And you can find additional optional uh, arguments that you can pass to an NWB file in the online documentation for PyNWB. We can print the NWB file object by simply calling print on the uh, variable. And then you can see the information that we've entered into the NWB file printed out here. Now let's create a subject object to store information about the experimental subject, such as the animal's age, species, genotype, sex, and a freeform description about the subject. You can see here a class diagram depicting the subject class, and the field subject ID is a text field that's required, and the other five fields um, are optional. Each of these fields is freeform text, so any values will be valid, uh, but here are, but we have some specific recommendations. For age, we recommend using the ISO 8601 duration format, for example, uh, representing 90 days old as P90D, um, basically P, uh, a number, and then a character depicting, uh, representing uh, days, months, weeks, years, etc. cetera. Uh, for species, we recommend using the formal Latin name, uh, for example, um, Homo sapiens for humans. Uh, for sex, we recommend using F, M, U, and L. In PyNWB, uh, we can import the subject class from pynwb.file, call the subject constructor, and pass in various keyword arguments, uh, and then store the, the uh, newly created subject object into the nwbfile.subject field. Neurophysiology includes a wide variety of data types. Uh, many of these data types can be stored in specialized classes in NWB. <clears throat> to store the spatial position of an animal, we will use the spatial series and position classes. Spatial series is a subclass of the time series class, and the time series is a common basic class for measurements sampled over time uh, that we will see over and over again in this tutorial and in others. Time series provides fields for data and time which can be regularly or irregularly sampled. Here's the class diagram for time series. You can see it has a name and a description field. Uh, it has a field for data, which has an associated field representing the uh, units of measurement, such as uh, volts or meters. It has fields for the sampling rate and starting time. Uh, if you have regularly sampled data, or if you have irregularly sampled data, you can supply an array of timestamps. Now, the spatial series class extends 
the uh, base time series class, which means it in, the spatial series class inherits all of these fields and it might refine or uh, add fields on top of it. Here, uh, the spatial series has refined the data field to be a two dimensional array, uh, n time by n features, and specifies a unit of measurement to be in meters. It also adds the reference frame field, uh, a text field that describes what a data value of zero means in the spatial series. Now, in PyNWB, let's create a spatial series object named spatial series with some fake data. We will import NumPy and we'll import the spatial series class from pynwb.behavior. Let's use NumPy to create some fake data with the shape 50 by 2. In pynwb, the first dimension of a time series or time series derivative should always represent time. So in this case, we have 50 timestamps uh, and two features, which will be x and y. Uh, then we have a one-dimensional array of timestamps here, also uh, 50, uh, with 50 elements. And then we will call the spatial series constructor, uh, pass it these various arguments, the name, description, data, timestamps, and the reference frame. And we'll store it in the variable spatial series object. You can then print this, this spatial series object to view its contents um, here. You can see all the data that we put in, as well as a few uh, additional fields, which um, have default settings, which you can change in the constructor if you so wish. To help data analysis and visualization tools, know that this spatial series object represents the position of the animal. Let's store the spa spatial series object inside of a position object, which is a simple object that can contain uh, one or more spatial series objects. You can see the position uh, class here has the name position, and it can contain one or more spatial series class, uh, objects. In pynwb, we can import the position class from pynwb.behavior and call the position constructor, passing spatial series, uh, passing the spatial series object in for the spatial series uh, keyword argument. Uh, if we have more than one, we can pass a list of spatial series objects here. Now. NWB differentiates between raw acquired data, which should never change, and processed data, which are the results of pre-processing algorithms and could change. Let's say if you change uh, a parameter in your algorithm when you rerun it, or you swap out different uh, algorithms for spike sorting or, or other pre-processing steps. Now let's assume that the animal's position was computed from a video tracking algorithm. So uh, the position would be classified as process data, and the, the raw video um, would be classified as raw data. Since process data can be very diverse in neurophysiology, uh, NWB allows us to create processing modules, which are like folders, in order to organize and store uh, process data that are related to each other or um, data that comes from a single algorithm uh, all in one place. So let's create a processing module called behavior for storing behavioral data in the NWB file and then add the position object to that module. To do that, we'll call um, the create processing module function on NWB file, uh, pass it a name and description, and then uh, we can call add on that processing module uh, with the position object that we just created. This prints out the contents of the behavioral module. Um, which consists of a position object and the spatial series object inside. And this class diagram here just depicts what a processing module is. It's just a container that has a name. It can contain any number of uh, NWB data types. Here we've created one called behavior and uh, we're linking it to have a position object. Now let's write the NWB file that we've created um, to disk. To do that, we will import the NWB HDF5IO class from PyNWB. I know this class name is a mouthful. IO uh, tells you that it's a uh, class for reading and writing files. And uh, this class will read and write NWB files using the HDF5 backend. And HDF5 is a common uh, storage format for large scale scientific data. Now we'll create a context manager um, to manage this uh, file reading, uh, file writing process, we'll call it with NWB HDF5 IO, 
pass the file name and pass w to open the file in write mode. We will get an IL object and uh, we'll call write on the IL object, passing in the NWB file that we created. We can then read the file and print it to inspect its contents. We can, uh, we can do that here by calling with NWB HDF5 IL, passing the same file name, and this time passing in R for opening the file in read mode. Then we can say io.read and we'll get back an NWB file object. We can then uh, traverse the NWB file that we got back and uh, go into the behavioral processing module um, and into the position object that we named position and the spatial series object that we named spatial series and print out that spatial series. There we go. Um, you can see uh, all the fields that we entered above, except now we have uh, the data field and timestamps fields are HDF5 data sets. Um, these data are lazily read, as in they are not read uh, immediately when you um, call this or access this variable, uh, because that data can be huge. It can be gigabytes large. Um, so in order to access these data, um, the, the values of these data sets, you have to do it explicitly, and I'll describe that later. We can also use the HDF view tool to inspect the resulting NWB file. HDF view is a common utility program um, supplied by the HDF5 group that you can find online. And you can see um, how the NWB file is structured internally. It has a bunch of uh, groups and data sets, and uh, our spatial series is stored in the processing uh, group, uh, which has a processing module called behavior, an object called position, uh, and within that a spatial series object. Trial information is stored in a time intervals object, uh, which is a subclass of dynamic table. Now, dynamic table is a common base class for storing tabular metadata throughout NWB, and it's used for storing trial information, electrode information, uh, information about your sorted uh, single units. And dynamic tables offer a lot of flexibility for storing tabular data by allowing us to specify required standardized columns, as well as giving uh, users the ability to, to store information in optional columns and add their own custom columns. Um, because trial information can be very diverse and many different aspects of a trial can't be standardized across experiments. And you might wanna store specific metadata uh, regarding your particular experimental trials. So this is the class diagram for a dynamic table. Um, it has a name, a description, and it has uh, columns that are of class uh, vector data, which um, and each column, the vector data column has a name and a description of its own. The time intervals class extends the dyna uh, dynamic table, and it specifies that there is a uh, start time column and a stop time column. Uh, and trials is basically uh, just an instance of the time intervals class that has the spe specific name trials. So um, this table, each row of the table represents a different uh, trial and has to have a start time and a stop time. Uh, this trial dynamic table, you can think of it in this way, um, where each column is, is stored basically independently uh, but within this group um, trials. Now let's continue adding to our NWB file by creating a new column for the trials table named correct, which will be a Boolean array. Um, you can do that by adding a trial column, calling add trial column on the NWB file object, passing the name and a description of this new column, and then we can call add trial to add a, a trial to the file. We have to specify a start time and a stop time, as well as any uh, columns that we've added to this trial table. In this case, it would be the correct uh, column. We can then view the trial table in tabular form by converting it to a pandas data frame. And there we are. Now let's store data specific to an optical physiology experiment. Optical physiology results are written in four main steps. First, we will create an imaging plane uh, that stores metadata about the imaging plane. And then we'll add the raw acquired two photon images. Then we'll add the image segmentation results into ROIs. 
uh, and then we'll add the fluorescence or DF over F responses. Um, so first, we'll, we must create an imaging plane object which will hold information about the area and the method used to collect the optical imaging data. So this uh, imaging plane here has a name, description, uh, various fields about the imaging plane, uh, and it also includes an optical channel and a device field. Now these uh, are required and they must be created before you can create the imaging plane. So an optical channel is, just has a name, description, and an, a uh, value for the emission lambda, and a device has a name, description, and a manufacturer. So first we'll create a device named microscope uh, in the NWB file object. And we can do that by importing the device class from pi nwb device. Um, and then we can call nwb file device um, or to create a new device in the nwb file object. And we'll give it a name, a description, and a manufacturer. We'll also import the optical channel class from pi nwb.ophys to create a new optical channel with these uh, values. Finally, we can create uh, an imaging plane in the NWB file uh, object um, by calling create imaging plane and passing all of these arguments, including the optical channel uh, that we created earlier and the device object that we created earlier. Okay, now let's store uh, the, the raw two photon series uh, data. Um, here we have two different options. The first option is to supply the raw image data to pi and the BB, right, the raw values, uh, using the data arguments of uh, a two photon series. And the other option is to provide a path to the image files that you're storing on disk uh, elsewhere. These two options have different trade-offs, so it's worth spending time considering how you want to store this data. Here's a diagram for two photon series. Uh, it has a required imaging plane, which we just created, and it has these various fields for data, external file, format, and dimension. Uh, you can specify either uh, data, uh, which has is three-dimensional and has uh, the axes uh, number of frames by width by height, or you can specify um, that you are linking files, uh, image files, and then you'll specify an array of external files um, and the format and the dimension of the data. So in pi nwb, we can use this code here. Uh, we'll import the two photon series class from pi nwb.ophys. And using the first method of storing raw data, uh, raw data values inside the NWB, nwb file, we will call the two photon series constructor um, and supply a data field in this case. Uh, and here we just set them all to ones. Um, and we will pass in the imaging plane that we set or we created earlier. Now using the second method where we have external uh, data files, we'll just store the file paths. So we won't uh, we won't pass in a data argument, but rather we'll pass in an array of external file names, uh, specify that the format is external, and specify the dimension of each of these images. Now since these two photon data are raw acquired data, Rather than putting them in a processing module in the NWB file, like for the computed spatial position data we created earlier, we will add them to the file as acquired data using the add acquisition method on the NWB file here. Now let's say we have uh, run a segmentation algorithm on these two photon uh, data, and we have regions of interest. The plane segmentation class will store the, de the detected regions of interest uh, from the raw data. Plane segmentation is a subclass of dynamic table, uh, just like the uh, trials table was a subclass of dynamic table, except here each row represents a single uh, region of interest, or ROI. Um, here you can see this uh, plane segmentation class has a column um, for image mask and pixel mask, which I'll describe uh, in a second, and it links to the imaging plane um, that we created earlier. Before we create the plane segmentation object in pi NWB, let's move up on in the hierarchy a bit. The, uh, next we'll create uh, the image segmentation class 
which can contain multiple plane segmentation tables so that we can store the results of different segmentation algorithms or different segmentation classes. So here we can see the image segmentation uh, class just contains one or more different plane segmentation tables. Um, and then let's put all let's put this image segmentation uh, object that we will create inside a processing module called OFIS to, to organize all of the optical physiology process data in one place. So uh, to do this, we will import image segmentation from pynwb.ofis and then uh, call its constructor and then call create plane segmentation on that image segmentation object. And we will uh, pass in a name, a description, imaging plane, and uh, any reference images um, for that plane segmentation. Um, one thing to note here is that uh, we are calling create plane segmentation from image segmentation so it will automatically be added this plane segmentation object will automatically be added um, to the image segmentation object alternatively we could import the plane segmentation class from pynwb.ofis uh, call its constructor to create a plane segmentation object and then uh, pass in that plane segmentation object uh, into the constructor of image segmentation to add it to that image segmentation. So two different methods of creating objects and adding them to other objects. One is create it and add it. The other is um, create the parent and then call a create method on that parent to add a child. Uh, next, we will create a processing module named uh, OFIS and give it a description and then we'll add the image segmentation object that we created up here uh, to that OFIS module. And you can see the contents here. Okay, now back to the plane segmentation table. You can add ROIs to this plane segmentation table using an image mask or a pixel mask. Uh, an image mask is an array that's the same size as um, a single frame of the two photon series, basically width by height, uh, and it indicates the mask weights for each pixel in the image. Um, image these values can be uh, boolean or continuous between 0 and 1. Here we're going to run through a loop of uh, 30 times creating a blank image mask of zeros and then picking a random int value um, and setting uh, a 5 by 5 region of that image mask uh, to 1. And then we will call the add ROI method on the plane segmentation object in order to add the ROI. And we can uh, plot it here. It's just this five by five uh, square. Alternatively, you could define ROIs using a pixel mask, which is an array of triplets of X, Y, and weights that have a non-zero weight. So all undefined values um, from the image are assumed to be zero. So it's just an alternative way of representing the data. Instead of storing um, a image, a full-sized image, where you, you specify the weight for each value, now you're specifying just a list of the values that have a non-zero weight. Um, whichever method you choose to define ROIs, image mask, or pixel mask, needs to be consistent within the plane segmentation table. So you cannot add some ROIs using the image mask method and some using pixel mask. So here, let's demonstrate um, use of a pixel mask for plane segmentations. Uh, first, we'll just create a new plane segmentation here, and we will uh, run through this loop uh, 30 times, uh, picking out a random 5x5 five five patch um, and adding, in, adding uh, these values, uh, these pixel values within the 5x5 five five patch into a pixel mask array, and then adding an ROI um, to the plane segmentation using add ROI, passing the pixel mask that we just created. We can then view the plane segmentation table contents. Um, let's view the one with pixel masks. Uh, we view it in tabular form by converting it to a, a pandas data frame, just like we did for the trials table. And you can see the, the values here. Now that we've stored the ROIs, uh, we can store fluorescence data for each of these ROIs. 
Now these uh, types of data are stored using the ROI response series and the fluorescence classes, which work similarly to the spatial series and position classes uh, we, made, we used earlier, except these types are specialized for optical physiology data. Um, now ROI response series is a uh, subclass of the time series class, and it specifies data as uh, n time by n ROIs, uh, and then it has a dynamic table region um, ROIs, which is a way to reference rows of the plane segmentation table of ROIs. And this is a way to, to know, uh, to tell this object, which ROIs uh, am I reporting data for? Uh, like for example, it could be the, uh, the first and the second ROIs in this plane segmentation table have data that we, that we recorded. And the rest of the ROIs uh, we did not record for this session for some reason. Um, so uh, just to reiterate that, to create an ROI response series object, we will first need to reference a set of rows from this plane segmentation table we created earlier uh, to indicate which ROIs correspond to which rows of the data. Um, we do that by creating a dynamic table region uh, which is a type of link that allows you to reference specific rows of a dynamic table by row indices. So to do that, we call on our plane segmentation object, we will call uh, create ROI table region and pass in a list of indices, list of row indices uh, for the table. Um, in this case, we're going to reference the first two ROIs of the table. And then now we'll create um, an ROI response series, passing name, data, um, the dynamic table region we created earlier uh, as ROIs, and then a unit and a rate. Okay, now to help data analysis and visualization tools know that this ROI response series object represents fluorescence data, we'll store the ROI response series object inside of a fluorescence object. Um, then we'll place that fluorescence object into the same processing module we created earlier named OPIS. So here's kind of uh, the ROI response series um, with the fluorescence uh, class, and the fluorescence class just contains one or more of these ROI response series, and uh, we can put this inside the OFIS processing module, just like uh, right next to the image segmentation for that uh, for the same data. Uh, in PyNWB, to do that, we will import the fluorescence class from PyNWB.OFIS. We'll call the fluorescence constructor and pass it the ROI response series that we created earlier. And then uh, we will add the fluorescence object to the OFIS module. Now, if you want to store DF over F data instead of fluorescence data, then we have a type for that. Uh, store the ROI response series object in a DF over F object instead of a fluorescence object. So basically you would import DF over F, the class um, from pynwb.ofis and call its constructor in the same way um, and add it to the OFIS module in the same way. Now let's write the file to disk. Um, we'll use the same code as before. All right, and then let's read the data that we just wrote. Uh, data arrays, uh, I just want to add that data arrays are read passively from the file, as I mentioned before. Uh, so whenever you call a, the data field from a time series object or a, uh, an ROI response series object or a spatial series object, etc., um, PyNWB will not read the data values because they could be huge, but rather it'll, they'll, PyNWB will present an H5Py object that can be indexed to read the data. And indexing this data works just like a NumPy array if you want to read, uh, in order to read a specific section of the array. Or if you want to read the entire thing, we use this operator, uh, this colon within square brackets. So to read the data, um, as I showed before, we'll create a context manager, uh, passing the mode, uh, the string R for opening the file in read mode, call io.read to get a file, NWB file object. And then we can print uh, first the two photon series um, data, and then we can print uh, the ROI response series data, this time indexing uh, reading the entire data field. So first here is the two-photon series um, 
data. And you can see that the data are not read into uh, pi n to bb, because that would be huge. Um, and then you can see we are printing uh, the data of the ROI response series uh, here, which are just uh, 50 by 2 array of ones. You can also um, pass in uh, index values here. Let's say you wanted to, to store or to print out the uh, 0 to 10th um, values in the first dimension and just the first column. You can say 0 colon uh, 10 comma 1 or actually comma 0 uh, in order to print that out. And that's it. To learn more about Pi NWB and uh, NWB in general, go to nwb.org and to see the tutorials, uh, our other tutorials for extracellular electrophysiology and intracellular electrophysiology, um, check out these links in the notebook. We also have more advanced tutorials um, and tutorials for the MATLAB side. Thanks.